teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, in the last program, we discussed all the ridiculous religious behavior of the Pharisees and their detailed attention to things that meant absolutely nothing. Now, someone has observed that the spiritually emptier religion becomes, the more attention is paid to ritualistic detail. And that eventually becomes a cover for insincerity and hypocrisy. I have a, um, a friend who's an Anglican Archbishop, highly educated man, and they go in for a lot of ritual and liturgy, and he thinks it's very important that you hold your hands a certain way when you celebrate the Lord's Supper. I don't think the Lord cares one bit how you hold your hands. What he cares about is the sincerity of your heart. But when you start getting into this kind of thing, then you're not far from insincerity and hypocrisy. And it, that's the way it was with the nominal adoration of the law by the Pharisees. And in the Pharisees, hypocrisy was so deep, it was in a great measure unconscious. I have been in certain parts of the world where the corruption in the nations is so bad that they don't even know they are corrupt. And that's tough when you get to that place. So their hypocrisy was so deep, it was in a great measure unconscious. And it was like members of Orthodox churches who know when to stand, to kneel, to sit, and if they're raising it, they grow up to do it without even thinking about it because it, they have done it for so long that's become automatic and meaningless. It's just a dead ritual. Well, even before the days of Christ, the Jewish rabbis have learned the art of straining out gnats and swallowing camels, which is what Jesus accused them of. He said, you strain at gnats and you swallow camels. They had long learnt to nullify what they professed to defend. And the ingenuity of the famous Rabbi Hillel was quite capable of getting rid of any mosaic regulation which had been found burdensome. And Pharisees and Sadducees alike had managed to set aside in their own favor by a logical device called mixtures they had learned to set aside all that was disagreeable to them in Sabbath scrupulosity. The fundamental institution of the sabbatic year had been stultified by mere legal fiction. And teachers who were on the high road to a logic which could construct rules out of every superfluous particle had found it easy to win credit with the people and ingenuity by elaborating prescriptions which Moses would have listened to in astonishment. And if there is one thing that is more definitely laid down in the law than any other, it is the uncleanness of creeping things, that you shouldn't eat creeping and crawling things. Yet the Talmud tells us that, quote, no one is ever appointed a member of the Sanhedrin who does not have sufficient ingenuity to prove from the written law that a creeping thing is ceremonially clean. And at the city called Jabney, there was an unimpeachable disciple, as far as the Jews were concerned, who could find 150 arguments in favor of the ceremonial cleanliness of creeping things. In other words, Moses is saying, you should not eat creeping things. And the Jewish rabbis in the day of Jesus had, some of them had 150 reasons why you could eat creeping things. And this is beginning to sound like one of our recent presidents, who when he was asked a question, he said, well, that depends on what the meaning of is is. And when we get to that place in life and get to that place as a nation, we're in a dangerous place. Now, phony logic like this was at work even in the days when the young student of Tarsus, namely Paul, sat at the feet of Gamaliel. 
And can we imagine for one second that he wouldn't have been wearied by a system at once so meaningless, yet so stringent and so insincere? That's a bad combination. Meaningless, rigid, stringent, and insincere. And could they fail to notice, that is, could the Pharisees fail to notice, and the Sadducees, that they usually violated what they trivially obeyed? Now, we may see from Paul's own words that these years must have been very troubled years for Paul. That's troubled in his being. And under the dignified exterior of the Pharisee lay a wildly beating heart, an anxious brain that throbbed with terrible questionings um, behind those broad phylacteries on his garment. Saul, as a Pharisee, believed in eternity. He believed in the resurrection. He believed in angels and spirits and in voices, in appearances, in dreaming dreams, and in seeing vision. But in all this struggle, and, and Paul, is, Paul is sincere. This is what sets Paul apart. He is sincere. He is one of those people who is for real and he is struggling to achieve his own righteousness. And this was a minutely tormenting struggle, so revoltingly burdensome that there seemed to Paul to be no hope, no help, no enlightenment, no satisfaction, no nobility, nothing but a possibly mitigated and yet inevitable curse. Okay, God won't get me right now but eventually he's gonna get me. That's the position Paul was in. And God seemed silent to Paul, and the heavens seemed closed. Now, as a Christian, if you're a spiritual Christian, a real Christian, there are times when God will be silent, and it will seem like the heavens are closed, and you can't hear from God. And let me tell you that when that happens, God is getting ready to speak to you. That's what's going on. God is not speaking to you to get your attention, to make you aware of it, so that when he does speak to you, you really are aware that he has spoken and you are aware that God is speaking to you. But now Paul was waiting. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, childcare, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. We're talking about the spiritual struggle that was taking place in the heart and the mind and the soul and the spirit of Paul 
he was in the midst of Phariseeism, which he could see was a hypocritical. Yet he was sincere. He was sincere. But God seemed to be silent to him, and the heavens seemed to be closed. No vision dawned on his slumbering senses, and no voice sounded in his very willing ear. And the sense of sin oppressed him. The darkness of mystery hung over him. He was ever falling and failing, and no hand was held out to help him. He strove with all his soul to be obedient, and he was obedient, and yet Messiah did not come. You know, there's a great song that we used to sing in Pentecostal, charismatic, evangelical circles. The song was, I tried to be, but I couldn't be a Christian in my heart. I struggled night and day, my moral debt to pay. But all the more my heart grew sore and in my agony cried mercy forevermore. And the song goes on to say, when at the end I met a friend, Christ Jesus was his name. He's everything to me, wherever I may be. And in our walk, we often talk how in eternity of treasures forevermore. This is the experience that Paul is going through and is going to go through. And the experience of Paul of Tarsus was heart-rending, as it is to all who have looked for peace elsewhere except in the love of God. There's a, a big parallel that students have noticed between what Martin Luther went through at Erfurt, the German city of Erfurt, what he went through as he struggled and what Paul went through. So the sufferings of Luther, Martin Luther, much later, 1,500 years later, at Erfurt, Saul must have suffered in Jerusalem. And the record of the early religious agonies and awakening of the one, and Luther has told us about his struggles in writing, so we know, and the record of the early religious agonies and awakening of the one is the best commentary on the experience of the other. What Luther experienced and wrote about is what Paul experienced, but didn't write about it in, in as detailed a way. Well, that the life of Saul was free from flagrant transgressions, we can see from his own bold appeals to his continuous rectitude, rightness. Now, Saul was not a convert from godless, godlessness or profligacy like John, John Newton or John Bunyan was. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, was a slave trader. He ran a slave ship. And listen, he went through a lot, but God converted him from a life of godlessness. But Saul wasn't like that. He claims integrity when he's speaking about his life in the aspect which his life presented to his fellow men. You know, we can look good to our fellow men. And as far as our fellow men, the people around us, our community, our society, society is concerned, we may be upright, but we know what we're like in our own being. We know what we're like in our own being. So in speaking of his life in the aspect which are presented to his fellow man, you know, he can talk of his rectitude, but he is vehement in self-accusation when he thinks of that life in the aspect which is presented to God. What his fellow man could see was one thing, but Paul knew what was in him, and he knew what God could see. And Paul found that no external legality could give him a clean heart. That's interesting. That's what the chorus says. The song says, I tried to be, but I couldn't be a Christian in my heart. And Paul couldn't be righteous in his heart. And he found that no external legality could give him a clean heart or put a right spirit within him. And he found that servile obedience, just being servilely obedient, inspired no inward peace. Now, he must have yearned from some right, for some righteousness, could he but know of it, which would be better than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. 
Well, Jewish doctors of law had imagined and directed that if a man did not feel inclined to do something along the line of this legal righteousness, he should force himself to do it by a direct vow. In other words, swear I'm going to do this and then do what he said he swore. And the famous Rabbi Akiva said, vows are the enclosures of holiness. But Paul the Pharisee, long before he became Paul the Apostle, must have proved to its very depth the hollowness of this direction. You can vow all you like. You know, promises are made, as they say, promises are made to be broken. Management promises its intent. And we can make vows and promises to ourselves and be, and be sincere in that vow. But it doesn't mean we can do it. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. So vows may be the enclosures of formal practice, but they are not, were not, cannot be, could not be the schooling of the disobedient soul. You can swear all you like and make all the promises you like, but that is not going to school a disobedient soul and cannot give calm to that place in the human being where the two seas of good and evil meet. There's a struggle that goes on within us. And Paul said, I find a law within me that when I would do good, you know, boy, there's an evil impulse in me. And so I do what I shouldn't do and don't do what I should do. Um, which is one of the good things about the confession in the mainline church where people say the words, you know, I've done those things which I should not have done and have not done those things which I should have done and I have not loved my neighbors myself. And to the heart which is the battlefield on which passionate desires clash into collision with positive command Man, what a tremendous struggle takes place and took place in Paul. Every six seconds, in developing nations all over the globe, a child dies for the lack of a few cents worth of food or medicine. As you've been listening to me, three children have already died. Children who have so much potential, dying a horrible death due to hunger. The change in your purse or your pocket could probably feed that child for a day or more. And yet that clock keeps ticking and children keep dying. For almost six decades, world missionary evangelism has been pulling children from the brink of death back to life. And we've been doing it through programs like Food for Hunger, Today, you can be a part of that. Today, you can save a life. Today, you can build a bridge from hopelessness to hope and fully show the compassion that you have in your heart. Why don't you make an impact and save one right now? The clock is ticking on another life. Won't you stop the death of one child? continue looking at the internal spiritual mental strugglings that Paul went through for some 20 years. And even when 20 years of weariness and wandering and struggle and suffering were over, and Paul had come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we still catch in the epistles of Paul the mournful echoes of those days of stress and storm echoes as of thunder when its fury is over. 
and it is only sobbing far away among the distant hills. We hear these echoes most of all in the epistle to the Romans because there were so many Jewish Christians or Christians of Jewish origin in the church in Rome. And we hear them when he talks of the curse of the law. We hear them when in accents of deep self-pity, he tells us of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, between the law of sin and his members and that law of God, which though holy and just and good and ordained to life, he found to be unto death. And in those days indeed, when he had thus writes, he had at last found peace and he had wrung from the lessons of his life the hard experience that from the works of the law, no man can be justified in God's sight. But if we are justified by faith in Christ and his work, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And though gazing on his own personality and seeing it disintegrated by a miserable dualism, there's, there's this Jekyll and Hyde in all of us before we come to the Lord. There's this struggle between that which we would do and that which we don't want to do, but we do in any case. And he still found a law within him which warred against the inward delight which he felt in the law of God. And though groaning in the body of weakness, he feels like someone who is imprisoned in a body of death. And he can still answer and answer the question, who shall deliver me? He can ex still exclaim with a burst of triumph, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But if the apostle, after he has found Christ, after he has learned that there is no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ, if he still felt the power and the con continuity, the ongoing of the inferior law, always there trying to degrade his life into that captivity to the law of sin from which Christ had set him free. At what kind of hours, how many hours of mental anguish must he have not passed through when he knew of no other dealing of God with his soul than the unsympathizing, mosaic, deathful commandment, quote, this do, and thou shalt live. The question was, could he this do? And if he could not this do, what hope and what help was there? Was there any voice of pity among the thunders of Sinai? Besides that, Paul had to wonder, could the mere blood of bulls and goats be any true propitiation for willful sins? But though we can see the mental anguish through which Paul passed in his days of Pharisaism, yet over the events of that period, really a complete darkness falls. We really don't know much, other than that, that he was struggling, we don't know much about this period of time, about his life, about what was going on. So there can only be two questions and both of them are deeply interesting. Uh, only be two questions that we have the power to, to answer. And the first question is, in those days when Paul was struggling with righteousness, did he ever see the Lord Jesus Christ? Physically, did he see him with his eyes? And at first we might suppose that the question was answered and answered positively in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1, when Paul says, quote, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? And our, we might say, oh, that means that he did see the Lord. And even more so in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, where he says, yes, though we have known Christ after the flesh, henceforth we know him no more after the flesh. It would seem that that is a statement that he saw the Christ 
but a little closer examination of these passages will show that they don't necessarily involve any such literal meaning. In the first of them, Paul cannot possibly be alluding to any knowledge of Jesus before his crucifixion because the mere external sight of him, had he seen him, from the position of one who disbelieved in him, so far from being a confirmation of any claim to be an apostle, would rather have been a reason for rejecting such a claim. It can only apply to the appearance of Christ to him on the way to Damascus or to some similar and subsequent revelation. Now, the meaning of the second passage, which we quoted, is less obvious. Paul had been explaining on the grounds of his apostolate in the constraining love of Christ for men. And he's shown how that love was manifested by his death to all and how the results of that death and resurrection are intended so utterly to destroy the self-love of his children, that is, the love of, of his children for themselves, so totally to possess and to change their individually that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And the Christ of whom he is speaking here is the risen, glorified, triumphant Christ in whom all things are become new because he is now reconciled man to God. Hence the apostle will know no man, judge no man in his mere earthly relations, but only in his union with their risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. World Missionary Evangelism began its work over 50 years ago with seven orphan children. Today, WME is working in developing countries around the world. Every day, WME programs are changing lives by meeting basic physical needs and saving souls by reaching out to the lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. You can partner with WME in a variety of ways to help those in desperate need. To learn more about WME's mission and work, please visit us on the web at www.wme.org. If you want to become a monthly sponsor for a child or native minister, support a particular project. If you would like to mail a donation, please send it to World Missionary Evangelism, P.O. Box 660800, Dallas, Texas 75266. You can make a world of difference in a precious life by contacting WME today. Thank you for your continued prayers and support of this ministry, and may God abundantly bless you.